Yeah. Wow. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to be a <laughs> Leave meeting. <laughs> Man, they changed it. I did not feel like that. Consent. Wait, one sec. <laughs> All right. We are good to go. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. I'm not editing that out. We just lost 70% of you. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, um, introductions are in order, I guess. Yes, Return of uh, the Muratsky, um, episode 15. It's good to have you back, man. Um, yeah. Episode 15? Yeah. So it was 15 episodes ago that we did mine. It was. So we haven't done this one. No. And Amazing. it was, yeah, it was great. A lot of things have happened since then. So in the first episode, we talked a lot about um, some of the art artist progress and process and all that. Um, and since then you released your first track, Estancia. I did. That's, so that's huge. Do you wow. want to, do you want to start us a little bit by talking about um, bringing us up to date from the end of last time we talked to how Estancia has been rolled out. I mean, that's a huge, huge process, but I think it's important to talk yeah. a bit about. Well, you know, we, we did it. We defeated the, uh, the inner monster that is uh, resistance, especially when you're trying to put your first real thing out. I think it's, that's when it's the strongest. So um, to me, and I, I said this before, but to me, the, the goal was pretty much to just beat, beat myself, like to win against myself. That was like the only outcome I really wanted with the song and like anything that came uh, after that was, was just extra. But obviously I wanted people to like the song <laughs> and, uh, and they have, which is really cool, which is really great. Yeah. You got a really great response. Um, from the beginning, um, a lot of people listening, you're able to play it in, couple clubs which was crazy yeah it was so cool <laughs> yeah yeah you want to hear the story of the, should i tell that story because that's a pretty good story yeah you should tell the story yeah, of yeah. the first club was crazy yeah okay so yeah that's like a fun way to kick kick start the episode um so i uh i went out to this rooftop club in Cabo. And uh, I went out with friends and the song was going to premiere that night at midnight, but I didn't have like, a, I wasn't going to roll it out with like at a club or anything. I was going to premiere it or anything like that. I didn't have anything planned. I was just like, oh, you know, we'll do the video, like the marketing kind of like, you know, the piece for it and, and that'll be it and then see what happens. Cause it's the first song to me, honestly, the goal is like to have, to have more stuff out. Like I, I don't expect. I don't necessarily expect people to become like, like you said, like from the Daniel like interview, Spotify interview, like you can't be someone's fan if they have like a single note. So to me, my, my sole focus is just getting more stuff out that I'm proud of. And then yeah. once I have enough things out where I feel like I could present it to present it as like more of a product, like a complete product where like, Oh, this is me. This is like 10 songs. Or this is five, six, seven songs. Then I, then I feel more confident. I guess in expecting some sort of not, maybe not some like, yeah, like expecting some sort of return where I can kind of think of more of like how to, how to market it and stuff even better. Like I'll, I'll do both, but I'm right. Yeah. Um, like when you only have one song out there, there, there's just not going to be the same kind of exposure to your work that there, there could be if you had a, a more songs out. And even if people really like you, they're, they can only listen to the one song again and again. Exactly. So that's why to me, it's like, can I get into the zone where I'm, writing and releasing writing and releasing super frequently so that people are engaged you know i think about casey neistat a lot when he was like at the peak of his vlog and i would wake up every morning uh, over the summer and i knew what i was doing in the morning like i wasn't yeah watching the news and i wasn't you know having breakfast first or whatever whatever i was like you know <laughs> maybe getting cereal and watching casey neistat and it was like yeah, like a routine, you know, so 
if you could do it with music in a similar fashion, not not in like a daily way, but if people go like, hey, you know, every month he's dropping a single, then it it gets really interesting for the people that are engaged. Um, yeah, so I'm learning to do that. Yeah, that's totally fair. And also, I think um, you get kind of a an ability to demonstrate your range, right? Especially as someone like you, who's interested in a lot of different types of music and writes from a lot of different perspectives and even even technical differences in the kinds of music that you would want to uh, produce. It's like, you don't really get to demonstrate that if you only have, have one song out, you know? And then you're, yeah. if you, even if people really love your song, your typecast is that song embodying everything that you are as a musician, which makes no sense. For sure. and. And that's why like not overthinking it is really important. I think when you're starting out, it's like, you know, if, if um, like I have a sign up that I'd have to twist the whole computer to see, but like it says, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. So it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, like I don't want to overthink the songs. Like if I'm working on something, I don't want to be like, oh, but is this the right next single? Like, I don't want to think of that. I just want to, do I like this song? Is it fun for me to work on? And is it fun for me to release and show my friends? And like, that's it. Don't anything beyond that right now is just like you're giving yourself trouble but uh yeah if you have like these expectations of it's going to be this and this and then it doesn't become that then you're going to be disappointed whereas if you just expect that this is just something i'm doing because i i want to do it then you know any pleasant surprises are much yeah, better. and i think it's important to, to have that too like i think i think once i have um more stuff out i'll I don't think expectations are like necessarily a terrible thing when you're pursuing a goal. Like, you know, you expect certain outcomes. I think that's kind of why you do it too. Like mm. it's fun. The process is great, but then you're like, Hey, I really want this to happen with it. I think that's totally fair. But I, I, uh, yeah. I think once before, you know, I think I, I should have more stuff out before I can kind of start talking. Like that. Yeah. I think we were, talking, we were talking about this a while ago about something Ed Sheeran said about how, a bunch of his friends were just like, oh, I just want to make music for me. And he was always like, I want to make, I want to be the number one, you know? And I think a lot of times it's like the, the old, is it Plato or is it Socrates? Like he who thinks he can, can, and he who thinks he can't, probably can't or yeah. whatever. Isn't it Confucius? Does Maybe. Really Someone like that. that. Some old, yeah. old, uh. They're both usually right. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that makes it more fun. I don't know if you're just waking up going, Oh, well, I got, you know, three streams. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in that. I don't think that's as fun. Yeah. You're not there yet. I mean, there's a time and a place for, for that maybe, but most of the time when, if it's something that you're doing as your main thing, you're probably going to want to at least have some degree of opportunity to share with a lot of people. You know, you're not going to just want it to be like, five people listening to it and playing in the back of like a wagon on on the side of the road you know like <laughs> yeah yeah like i mean and as artists i think a lot of artists like crave that connection with people and that's where the, the wanting to reach millions of people comes from. it's not that like you necessarily want to be the yeah. most famous person in the world it's like oh that's insane that all these people have heard this story and heard this story. Like, that's awesome well, music's kind of an inherently collaborative um, art form in a way. Like you can do a lot by yourself, and obviously, you know, more and more with stories of people. Even kind of what you're doing, like just making everything in your in the basement, in the home studio, that kind of idea. But at the end of the day, I think the ultimate goal, and historically, what music has, why music has been such an important integral part of different cultures, is because you know it's an important communication method it's a it's collaborative a lot of times you know i i agree and like that's why when i'm working on these first songs it's like i i, I have it in mind that my goal is to to be in a position one day where i can work with great musicians and in really cool spaces you know and like like i want to do that you know and when you're in my position right now, you know, you do the best with what you've got. And like, there's been great records that have been made, like so many great big records now are just made, you know, in a room or in a house somewhere, or, you know, on the computer. So there's definitely no excuse and there's no real limitations that way. But not, especially given like how we came up in at Fine Arts, it's like, yeah, I don't, for, I don't like forget 
how important and how big of an aspect that is in music making. So like even the other day, like I got to play with a really cool drummer. I told you about like Giuseppe Spargo and he's in Nashville and he just came to Cabo for a few days and like he played a few of my songs. It's not like I could record them. Like I don't have a crazy drum, drum studio, like drum room with like nine mics, but we played and it was like so cool. It was like so, it was so inspiring, right? And I was like, oh yeah, like I keep that, I keep that at the forefront of my mind when I'm thinking of where I want to go next. It's like, yeah, yeah you get to work with all these really great musicians. Like that's an awesome thing to aspire to. And collaboration and, and network, I think, no matter what you do, are two of the most important um, elements of really finding what either you're finding your niche or connecting with other like-minded individuals. I was actually talking with Mr. Lanesbury earlier today about uh, about this, and he was saying that, you know, one of the projects he would like to work on is bringing together all of the alumni who are pursuing music as a career that have gone to fine arts. Because of course, you know, there's people who have, are, you know, in rock bands, in symphony orchestras, working in, you know, high level education. Um, he's close friends with the drummer from Mariana's Trench, right? So like bringing all these people together and um, helping I guess pave inroads for people who are interested in pursuing it and and uh, provide opportunities for networking. And I think that's super important to network. Um, it's almost like in business, you kind of have to think about it that way, right? Like when even even when you're doing an art, not to over economize it, but to you know treat it like something that you know you should be providing some level of value. It's not just completely <laughs> fun, right? And and that goes for when you're feeling not as confident, like when you know most people i don't know i think a lot of people have those days where you're like oh what, what not like what am i doing but like oh this is like <laughs> this is hard or what yeah what's it, hey, what do i have to like i don't even know what i should be doing today to move things forward you look at i think where you are now and where you want to be and there's too much yeah, yeah and it's kind of overwhelming like those kinds of days and like i sometimes the other day i had this thought it's like well you know let's say your goal is to sign with a label like some people's goal is is that to get like a really good deal with a great label. Let's just say that's it. You know, some people want to stay independent and some people don't. You would look at it as like, you're talking about the value thing. Like it's not just them providing you value. If you look at yourself as having just as much leverage, it's kind of like a big, you know, or you with your, with books, you know, with writing. It's like, wait a second. It's not just one side helping the other here. Like if you have a really great product, and not only do you have a really great product, but you as a person are a really effective writer or you're really skilled, like, you know, in music, you're a really great producer, you're a great writer, you're a great performer, this and that, like, you, you should feel pretty confident about that. Like, yeah, it shouldn't just feel like, oh, please let me in or like, please, da -da -da, like, work with me. Like, you should have that in your mind, too. It's like, wait a second, I have a lot to offer here as well. Yeah, and I think um, self-esteem is a challenging thing, right? Like a lot of people, I, I think, don't necessarily um, find it super easy, even when you maybe are offering a lot of a lot of value for something. But it is an important thing to remember that um, anytime you're doing anything, you're offering a certain degree of value to it, I guess, right? And and you're a component in the equation, and you have to recognize that you're integral too. You know, you're an important element that can't be outsourced that's the goal at least right to, to put yourself in a position when you are that <laughs> yeah yeah especially when you're um i think anytime you're selling something right like anytime you're bringing something to market hmm. i feel like you're really providing value for people and it's not just like you're trying to convince people to like it's like you're tricking people <laughs> i think it's a way better approach to be like oh wait well, a second for like, some people it might be <laughs> yeah yeah but to be like, you know, I'm really providing something that's valuable here, that's worthwhile and is worth people's time and money and attention. Uh, I think I think it's a healthy mindset to have, especially in art. I think it's the only way to be like content. You know, if you're not doing that, you're going to you're going to know that in your <laughs> in your heart, you'll know that you're kind of scamming people. And so I don't think that can ever feel good. No. <laughs> 
You know, they're making some pretty niche art. <laughs> He's scamming people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah There's a Picasso like, original, I swear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, they're... or like a white painting. It's just like a white, just like a canvas. Yeah, just a canvas. <laughs> and you're like, it represents the, like, the vastness and the absence of joy in the universe or something. <laughs> yeah, your signature at the bottom. Exactly. Hey, maybe that, maybe that could, if someone's willing to pay something for it, Maybe that's what it's worth. That is what it's worth, inherently. Yeah, at least from yeah. that perspective. So, okay, one thing that I think is really interesting, and we kind of touched on this a little bit, um, not directly, but with Estancia, when you were first writing it, um, you're, you, most of your songs that you'd written were in English, and you were kind of planning on writing in English. And you kind yeah. of took like a bit of a turn where you, you recognize that like you had a specific value to offer as somebody who is very well versed in both Spanish and English. Yeah. And so you ended up writing the song in both languages, which it comes across super well, super interesting. But how did you, how did you decide, like what kind of factors led to your decision to, to approach it from that perspective? Yeah. You know, but yeah, you're right. Like, I came up, even though at Fine Arts we sang a lot of um, music in different languages, I, I was sort of, when I started writing, when I started really thinking about what I wanted to do, like in pop music, because that's what I wanted to make, mm -hmm. um, which just means music was popular. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what is that actually I, what it means? Yeah, <laughs> I always thought it was like I always thought it was like something to do with like the do, 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 like something like that. <laughs> that's, a, that's awesome. Yeah, that's it's weird. popular music. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I I started writing in English because I mostly was listening to singer songwriters, um, you know, in, in English, and a lot of my heroes were were like that, but when when you come here, first of all, and, I, and you know I always loved music in Spanish, like I always played it, but I just never really, I, I wasn't really sure I would write it. Well, you saw them as separate, as far as I can tell, like you you love to do music and, and like we, would, we even sang a few songs in, um, in yeah. Spanish, like in the guitar duet and stuff, but I even remember you talking about how you didn't really like the mixing, like in within one song, you were kind of like, yeah. like doing separate songs or something like that. And then you kind of changed it, you know? Yeah. Your perspective. I, I didn't. It's true. Yeah. You're the, yeah. I don't know. I don't know why that was to be honest, but hmm. I know now I know when I was in Canada and I was writing about stories that were happening there, it was really easy for me to write them to only think of them in English because they were happening in that language. English, yeah. Right? And like a lot of the songs of mine feel like sort of letters to people or to situations. So it's kind of like you, you're writing it in that language, right? Like, and obviously here, it's not kept in detail. Uh, but obviously when you're here and stories arise, um, you kind of feel like you want to tell, tell it in the language that it happened in, right? Like, almost yeah. like, especially if there's people involved, you're like, oh, I want this person to really get it. And there's probably differences too, right? Like um, in how, not only, like obviously there's differences in how you would tell language, how tell a language, how you would tell a story depending on the language, right? Because yeah. there's certain things that you would say in one language that you wouldn't say in another, or like the way that you would say it would be different or the ideas that you would express would be expressed in slightly different ways, I guess. But like the probably, title. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's interesting. Maybe explain that for the non-Spanish yeah, like, speaking. <laughs> yeah, like the title only works in Spanish. That word only works in Spanish, right? And like, and also I love like, and I don't remember like oftentimes with songs, you kind of don't remember not having it. Yeah. I don't know if that happens to you with stories or with songs or with you know anything you've created, but like. It almost like I almost can't remember it not existing or something. Oh yeah, and no, as soon as you write something, it's like it feels like it's always there. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And I remember, I don't remember when I had the title, but it wasn't called that. Like when I first came up with the music for it and I started writing it, I didn't have that title. It was like some other oh, song. song number 15. No, it was like ideas that had to do with the story, but they were in English. I think it was like careless, you know, some whatever. And not as good as uh No. And Estancia is so visually like nice to me and yeah. and sonically, like the way you speak it, it just sounds like the song. Like to me, Estancia with the C and the S and stuff, like sounds like the synths. And like sounds like the I don't know, like it's That's so specific. I never thought of that, but yeah, you can totally. It, like, it's that. so specific to me. Like when I had that title, I was like, this is, I love the way this feels. Like even just the, and, I, and I'm big on like the way titles look. Like when I have a title, I write it, I write it out just to see it, to see how the letters look. Mm -hmm. Like there was something so symmetrical about that title and something so nice about the E and the, like, I don't know, it just like looked, yeah. it looked and it's important to me that titles look good for some reason so um, in 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 english it roughly yeah. translates to stay but it doesn't quite like yeah um, yeah so, there's an so element of temporality i guess in it that's not in the english word right yeah like the example i use is when someone says uh enjoy your stay like oh hope you enjoy your stay that would be distancia, right like and that, that only means enjoy your stay in that context in English means like enjoy your stay because you're here temporarily. But in Spanish, that word is always temporary. It's always like your stay at this place. It's like your, your time here, you know, your, your being here for a while. Because in English, there's like a sense of permanence and stay, you know, like the word yeah. stay is like inherently permanent. Yeah. But I'm, but there's like different word in Spanish for a more inherent. Yeah permanent stay versus a like temporary stay. Exactly. Like contextually it's it's implied already what what it means when you just say the word. You know, it just means like, you know, your time here. It's like your your almost like your time here. That's yeah. you're spending here. But there's there's that inherent um temporary element to it. Which is like I love and it, it's not like I thought about it. I just kinda had the word and I was like, oh that's great. And then I, yeah, I don't know. I don't remember not having it, but. So cool. There's something so, uh, so like interesting and unique just about different languages, you know, like just the idea of language too, like expressing things in, in different languages too. So cool. Yeah. And even on the writing side, like I had the whole, the whole English verse, um, I had pretty quickly. I think I wrote, I don't know how, how quickly, but like I had it, I had it for a while. I had it for a while before I had the Spanish one. And I had a ton of versions of the Spanish one. And uh, originally I wanted it to be a duet. So I'd written like a different perspective from the girl's point of view. And then it, it turned out that I was just gonna do it on my own. So I was like, okay. So I kept writing verses and then something happened in the story in real life that inspired that actual last verse. And I was like, okay, great. Let's write it about and did so, you write once you had that experience did the uh verse come fairly quickly or was it a uh, i had a lot of versions of it still like i i had ideas for it because i'd written about the situation for the second verse so there were things that were themes in the in the situation with this person i was like okay i had some ideas for it so some of those stayed like there's that line, one of my favorite lines in the song is siempre que voy te vas, like every time I come, you leave. So that was there before, but that actually ended up happening uh, more obviously, <laughs> which inspired the the, bird, like the rest of that second verse. But yeah, I, I remember after that, just going out to cafes and going out to the, to the garden here and just writing and writing and writing. And there's like a, there's quite, there's a lot of versions of that verse, but it got, I was just chiseling it. Yeah. You know, I was got fine tuned. Was it, yeah. was it, uh, did you find it more challenging to write in Spanish, like having written more in English? Or was it pretty like ambidextrous in terms of your ability to write? Yeah, that's a really good question. I thought it would be harder than it was. If anything, I would say that 
it inspired different like writing muscles and perspectives because in english i freestyle a lot as you know yeah. and like i'll sit down with the guitar and a piano or like i'll put on a beat with friends and like i'm really used to freestyling so language in english is kind of kind of feels like an instrument and sometimes you can get into sort of routines with the way you use words and the way you craft lines and if you're if you don't sit down to write oh you know, right so when I'm sitting down to just write, it really inspires fresh ways of saying things and new ideas and even, and it's still very musical. The thing about freestyling is that you'll come out with words and lines that feel very musical because you're singing to the melody in the moment. And then maybe you have to fine tune it because that didn't make a ton of sense, but like you have the way the vowels work and like, so that's good too. But to me, but like, you might also get kind of um, accidentally fall into a pattern that you don't necessarily want. Whereas maybe, it like, maybe in Spanish, it can be a little more like idiosyncratic because you're like, okay, like I haven't freestyled in Spanish as much. So when I write it down, I'm like, okay, what do I need to say? And then you're like, okay, well, yeah. that's rhyme. Like, how do we figure which out a way is, to say that in a better way? Which is how I've kind of always written songs like, you know, a lot of the times, like I, I do freestyle verses on top of stuff, but then I'll, I'll replace it. But um, I, I always came up like, I came up writing was like its own thing most of the time. Like writing lyrics was like me going out with a notebook to a park and just writing the lyrics and like you didn't have a piano or a guitar because you had like the melody in your head and you knew the chord progression and you had these like temporary lines that you're replacing. But I would always make time to write, as you know. Like I always would make time to just sit with a notebook and a pen, and that was all you had, and there were no distractions. Because it's really fun to be like da -na 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 -na, and just sing for a while with a piano. But if you're just like, all right, we have we have that. That's you wrote that part. Like you, you can you can write the lyrics now, and like that's its own thing. That's really mm. that can be really fulfilling because then it, you're like, wow, the the lyrics are great. And, and to me, a song isn't, I have so many song ideas, like sitting on the computer, they're like, I show to people and they're like, why don't you drop that? I'm like, because that doesn't mean anything yet. It doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. So only until it means something to me lyrically and narratively, does it, do I want to put it out or do I even see it as a song? So it's so important to me. Yeah, that's really interesting. So I, think, I think that's a kind of common thing when you're trying to create something like how much of this is just about what we talked about earlier a little bit about quantity about putting enough things out so that people can listen to you and how much of it is like okay i'm only putting things out that really speak to something that i'm trying to articulate and i'm not willing to uh, put something out at the expense of it not being special enough even if it would mean that I have more things out there that people can listen to me. I guess it's like a, it's like a fine tightrope. Like how do you navigate that challenge? And, and you know what? I think, I think that's on you as a writer to sit down and write. Like in the work, it, it kind of pays off. Like as a, it's not like, it's not like you sat down for 12 days and you came up with nothing. Like it's usually, you have stuff to say. And, and that's on you to make it mean something because totally right. Like it's just a time investment. Yeah. A lot of writers say, and, and, you know, sometimes this runs the risk of being highly irritating, <laughs> but I think musicians too, but a lot of people who write say like the best advice I can ever give you is write. And it's like, all right. On the surface level, you're like, that's annoying. But when you think about it, it's actually kind of helpful because it's the last thing that you want to do when that's what you do. It's so weird. Like if you're a writer, like the last thing, sometimes you, people can just sit down and write and write and write like Stephen King or something. It's like, well, good for you. Like, that's great. But I feel for most people, they're just like, Oh, I don't know how to say this. Like, I don't know how to say this. And it can be distracting, but you just have to kind of run through the, the, you know, nasty tap, have it going. And then once the water gets clearer as it goes gradually kind of thing. 
There just seems to be no way around it. Like you can get maybe lucky once in a while where you can write this whole thing in, in one go. I, I find, you know, if I'm not feeling that great about things in general, it's because I haven't written something interesting that's inspiring me. And like, mm. and, and that's because you didn't want to sit down with a pen and a notebook and work and like write. And it's hard work. It's, yeah, it's not easy. And it, it's not easy to be like, you know, you can write and write and write and like you're writing kind of not great lines and things that aren't like hitting you. And then, and then it kind of starts going and you're like, oh, great. Like that's really great when that happens. But yeah, you need no. to sit down and you need to do it. And, and, and what you just said about that, like writing and writing and sometimes things just seeming to be not working and then all of a sudden it clicks it, it almost seems like um how the story coalesces it's important to just write and just get through everything because once you express what is it like i don't know if statistically one in 50 ideas is good then you want to get out 500 ideas as quick as you can so that you got you know enough stuff to work with right like it becomes more focused as we go yeah it's like it's like you start getting closer to what the story you're trying to tell is the more you keep walking through that cave like the light at the end of the tunnel it's like you just keep writing you're like yeah and you're getting closer and you start seeing that light and you're like oh that's the real that's like the that's the story in its purest form and when you write like something that you're really proud of it doesn't matter if people you know what other people think but if you're really proud of it it's probably because you wrote that story in the only way you feel like you could have written like oh i got to the end of that like yeah. I got to the pure, the true version of that. And that's really cool. It's a pretty special part of being able to be a creative, to use the, you know, uh, computer <laughs> form. <laughs> um, like whenever you're creating something, um, I think human beings are inherently kind of storytellers, but it's really like there's a certain value in stories that it's just you can't get anywhere else I, I i don't remember who said it but there's evidently a jewish saying like what's more true than truth and it's stories you know and i think uh i really kind of it's the nail on the head and, and it's there's certain ideas you can't express in any other way other than a relatively abstract way because obviously you could just say like this is the story this is what happened and that's what we do when we talk. That's what language is, right? That's com we're communicating stories. In a way, it's like everything's like we're nobody knows. You could be lying to them. It's just a bunch of stories going around, and you take people at their word, or maybe you don't trust that person because they've lied before or whatever. But when you create something like a song or a book, you're you're almost going one layer below that, where you're like, all right, so like, what's the meaning of the facts, you know, or something like that? Yeah, I li I really like that. Quote. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really cool. I've never heard. Yeah. So you're gonna say something about the uh the club, but I don't think yeah. you end up getting to that story. Do you wanna Yeah, I'll I'll try to tell it in the most efficient way possible. Fair enough. Um so I was there with friends and they were like, Yeah, like you know your songs coming out and I was like, Yeah. I was really excited about it, just for myself that I had finished something that was coming out and people were gonna hear it. Obviously I hadn't planned on it playing anywhere yet and often the coolest things happen when you don't plan them so i didn't think had i planned that night i don't know if it would have been as perfect as it as it was because that was honestly one of the coolest nights ever you know it's like the first song and it played at a at a really popular club so it was like um i was there and <laughs> And uh, they were playing me. I, I, to, I wish I could. I, you know, the story is way more compelling with details, but there's, as you know, there's details I can't share in the story that make it even more interesting. But I was at this place, and uh, the DJ was, you know, playing music. He was a really good DJ, and there were there were like a ton of people there. And it was like a really great night at that place. And, you know, people could barely get in. It was like, I remember people tried to call and like they couldn't get, get, a, get into the, so it was like a phone, right? And I was like, 
It's like you might as well ask if he can just play the song. Like you're here and it's like full and that'd be amazing. You might as well ask this guy. And I was like, yeah, like whatever. So I go up to this dude and I said, hey man, like, listen, um, I have this, I'm, I have the song that's coming out today. It would just mean the world to me if you could play it. And he goes, and he's like a kind of annoyed. He's like mildly annoyed for me, like with me about asking it. And I was like, and the guy kind of looks at me like, oh man, like, and I said, I said, tr like, trust me, it's, it's going to really hit, like, it's meant for this kind of venue. And he's like, it's like, what kind of, what kind of song is it? And I kind of like sang the beat for him. And, uh, and he goes, okay. And I said, trust me, like, I, I, I really need you to trust me. I was like, it's going to be great. Like, I know it's going to work if that's what you're worried about. Like, it's going to work really well. And he was playing like those kinds of beats and that kind of tempo. And so I was like, this is great. This is, of course, this is great. And I said, you just need to trust me. And he goes, man, like, I just really, and I said, and I pulled like the most, what people probably call a really arrogant line. But I was like, you know, I need to convince this guy. I was like, listen, I'll thank you at the Grammys. <laughs> I was like, I'll thank you at the Grammys as the first DJ to ever play anything of mine. And like, it'll mean the world to me. I was like, you don't understand what it'll mean. And he goes, okay, I'll play it. Do you have a USB? Do I have a USB? I was like, like, do you have it on a USB? No, I didn't come to the club with a USB in my pocket with my song. I was like, it's on, it's going to be on spot. I was like, I have the file. If you want, I can just email you the, he's like, I can't bro. Like you gotta have it on the USB. I was like, it's going to be on Spotify in like 20 minutes. He's like, I can't dude. Like, I, don't know. I was like, Oh, and then I kind of walked back to my table. I was kind of bummed out. And then I have these moments a lot where I, you kind of feel like you've lost and then you try one more time and it works. So I was like, kind of thought about moments like that. And I was walking back and I was like, one more time. Like we got to try just like, we got to push just a little. And so I went back to him and I said, if I go get it on a USB, will you play it for real? And he goes, yeah. And I said, what? Okay. Boom. And so I go to the manager and they don't let people in after a certain hour. They just let you out and that's it. And you can't come back in. And I told the manager, the club uh, manager, and I said, listen, like I have a song coming out. I explained the situation. And I said, do you either have a USB stick in your office that I can like drag? my song into or like can you make sure i get back in and he goes go he's like go home go go get it go get it he's like massive dude and he's like <laughs> he's like go go i'll make sure i'll make sure it's all good and so he calls all the security guys on the way out and all the valet guys and my car's waiting and i'm running and i run to the car get in i drive home uh I'm looking for USBs in the house. Like I can't find it. So I just grab my hard drive, like my big hard drive with like a ton of my music on all like script. Drag it in and uh, and I drive back. There's like clubs closing in like 40 minutes, 30 minutes. But it's still it's still going. Like it, it really stops going when they turn on the lights and it's done. So it wasn't like it was dying down. It was like, you know, perfect. So I give it to the guy and he goes, cool. And then the manager comes to the guy and he goes, what are you playing this song? What are you playing? Like, you know, he's like pushing the guy to play. And the guy's like plugging it in and it's not reading it. And he goes, is it on a Mac? Did you have this plugged into a Mac? I was like, yeah. And he goes, yeah, sometimes this happens and like, it's not working. I'm like, what? I'm like, that, this blows, man. I'm like, this is, and I'm looking at all the people dancing. I'm like, I want it to be my song so badly. And I'm like, oh, like, what? Like, what's happening? Like, why isn't this working? And the guy's like trying his best. And he's like, bro, like, I promise. I'm, I'm like, I know, like, I see you trying. I'm like, what's going on? And he's unplugging it, plugging it back in. I'm like, wow, like this, this sucks, man. Like, this would have been really cool. I was really excited about it. Like the day my song comes out, plays at this club. And like, I'm like, that's amazing. But it wasn't happening. And the guy's looking at me like, I don't know. And then I said, well, there's got to be something we can, like, can we air, like, can we do anything? He didn't have a Mac, so we can airdrop it. And my phone was, like, being really weird. It just wasn't working that well. And so I grabbed my, my sister's phone at, like, 3%. And the guy goes, if you email it to, like, my 
if you put on a file sharing and then I download it from the file sharing, maybe like on a, on the cloud and then bring it back. So my sister gets it on her, I airdrop it to my sister. My sister puts it on her phone. She uploads it to this file sharing thing. He downloads it. It works. And then their songs playing. I'm like, my song's not coming yet. There's like another song. I'm like, oh, when's he going to play it? And the manager comes to him and he's like, he's like, yo, why do you play this song? And he's like, right out. He's like, no, it's next. It's next. <laughs> and the guy looks at me and he's like, the manager's like, you, you, I'm sending drinks to your table and stuff. And like, I was like, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and then all of a sudden, the song starts playing. And then like a lot of my friends were there. So a lot of people had heard that intro and like they heard it in the trailer and stuff. And they were telling, they were going around telling everybody that I had a song coming up. And so by that time, a lot of people knew what was playing. And people, people that knew me that were there kind of went, went a little nuts and, uh, and I did as well. And then <laughs> boom, the, the beat comes in and then everyone just starts dancing and everybody's like, you know, it was really, it was surreal. And, and, uh, and all a ton of my friends were there and everyone's got their phones out. There's people with their Shazam out, uh, that, like people Shazamming the song, like people I didn't know. And, uh, and then people just started coming up to me after and like asking me about the song, like what it was called. And like, they were like, I tried to Shazam it and it didn't work. I was like, yeah, cause it's not out yet. It was like out in 20 minutes. So people, everybody that Shazammed it was just not going to get it. So I was like going up, people were like asking the manager who they'd heard like the song and the person that did the song was there. I was like going to tables and people were coming to my table and asking me about the name and screenshotting it. And, like, so it was really, it was, it couldn't have been better. Dude. Yeah, it couldn't have been better. And yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was a really cool night. To hear it, to hear it at a at a club like loud like that, and people are dancing is pretty crazy. Especially because I wrote it for that kind of setting. Yeah, that in cars, you know. And almost in a way, like it not working on so many fronts almost makes it sicker because it's just like it very oh, movie like. Finally made it. <laughs> very movie like. It could have been really funny if it was just like you go up to the guy and go oh, sure, and then he just plays it. It's kind of like anti-climactic almost in a way even though yeah it's the same I mean, it, would have, like, it would have been the same effect but like a very yeah. different journey so which uh, i guess proves that life is not about the conclusions right no like you know me driving home getting the hard and the hard drive not working and so we just end up doing the thing we could have done regardless <laughs> like what it was really cool man. it's pretty yeah. funny yeah yeah that's crazy. So what, what is it looking like right now for you in like the, the music pipeline? Do you have any other songs coming along pretty soon? Or are you going to take a little bit of time continuing to work on production before you release another song or? No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to release, I'm going to release soon. I, I want to, I really, I, I really think if you get into, if you put in the work, you'll, you'll get the result. And it's just like making sure you have your, your main, goal at the yeah. forefront of your mind when you wake up and like you know what you're supposed to be doing it's it's important man because because then everything you do aligns with that and after the song came out i was like sort of overthinking everything i was like oh what are the books now and then i would go out and people would ask me because like it was really pulling out and people like i didn't know were like ah this is this song. i was like oh that's like, that's so cool especially in Cabo, the way stuff gets around is like it's pretty cool and yeah. yeah, and like people rolling down their windows in their car and the song playing. I'm like, ah, why? Yeah. So I was kind of like, what? <laughs> yeah, and I was like, what, what's next? What's next? And like, I, you kind of you don't want to have the audience in mind too much when you're working on stuff and thinking about what's next. So I was like, you know, what's next is you have fun, just like you did with the first one. You put that. Mm -hmm. So, so um, yeah, I was um. I, I I was kind of, I had a ton of demos going after and it was kind of like all over the place after the song came out. And uh, I think that's kind of a risky, that's, the, that's kind of like a, a thing about having really high quality production at your disposal with tech, with technology that we have now. Mm -hmm. Is that like, you can have an idea and you can kind of make it sound like something really cool in a day or two. 
but the idea was never complete. And it's this, you have these like incomplete, really cool things. So you're like, I'm not going to release it. And then you go, stuff. oh no, wait a second. You know how stuff gets done is you hone in on something and you go, this is the project. And you gotta, and, and you can't spare yourself that dedication and that discipline and that work. I don't think maybe yeah. you get to a point where it's just like, dude, like this free thing. I think you gotta, so. Yeah, I think um, like you have to do like, one thing at a time, you know, with work on doing something well. Um, you can obviously split yourself up, do more things and more things. But I think anytime you do that, you're just slightly less efficient and it's going to be slightly less good for the thing that you're doing. Or I guess you could take a longer time doing two things and do them probably equally well. But that are pretty different. Yeah, I think if they're really different, it's almost almost better. I, I've heard this about learning languages too, where it's like if you're trying to learn two languages that are like similar at the same time, it might be some challenges in that they you get things mixed up. But if you learn two very different languages, it sometimes can be a benefit because it's not... Yeah. Mm, yeah, you're not going to mix it up. So who knows? Yeah, yeah, I think I think you can work on a few things at once, but it, it's um, ho hopefully they're a little bit different. So that if you're not going to work on that thing, you're working on this that's kind of stretching different muscles, especially on the production front. Yeah, and it's, I don't know, there, there's people who release like pieces of music or books on a very very consistent basis and you're like i don't know how this person writes that many things in that short amount of time and then there's other people who spend like 10 years working on one project you know yeah. and i think that it's just different but it's like going into it you need to know what you're trying to accomplish is very different you know and it's not even just like oh what's gonna get more money or more views or more streams because you could write a song in like 10 minutes that is like one of hundreds of songs that you write you know maybe you're a fast output and maybe you get tons of streams um but maybe like a, a book takes 10 years to write um not a lot of people read it but it becomes more important with time or something i just think it's very different you know if you're spending a lot of time looking into something it's probably on average going to be more maybe philosophical and deep and some maybe more challenging ideas are being expressed. Whereas if you write something in 10 minutes, I mean, you might just be a genius, but most likely it's not going to be, you know, a super challenging idea, you know, or it could just be a combination of, of times that you've failed. And then finally in 10 minutes, it all comes together. Yeah. Well, that's different, but that can happen too. Like where, you know, you write a song in 10 minutes, but really it took you 10 years to write it because yeah. based off of all these experiences and stuff, what is that? Um, I can't remember who said this either, but there was a antidotal thing where uh, this artist charged, I think a hundred bucks for a painting. And the person who got the painting said, oh, you know, I really like it, but I, I don't think, you know, you only took you five minutes to make. So it seems like a lot for a hundred bucks. He said, no, it took me 20 years and five minutes, you know, cause of the idea that you, you had to spend all that time training. So I think. Yeah. Uh, that's I find that with, with production too. Like, yeah, totally. Like I, like two years working on it before you released anything. Yeah, and also even just after Estante came out, I would I would come into the studio and and just make instrumentals or just make beats or just make you know stuff like that and then sing over them and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, am I wasting time here? I was like, shouldn't I just be like with a guitar and a piano writing and then coming in and producing it? Or, but I I, I find like anytime you're doing anything, sort of that has to do with with your art, you're you're being productive like. I found stuff that I made that like, you know, I'm not going to use that instrumental, but that one thing I learned how to do with the hi hat and like, I really got it grooving and I learned how to do that when it was actually time to use it for something where it actually applied and it was a musical choice and it made sense. I was like, Oh yeah, this, there you go. And then the more stuff like that you learn, the more you have in your toolkit so that when you hear something in your head, you're like, I know where to reach, you know, I know where to go, yeah. you know, like, Oh yeah, that's the thing. And remember when you did, yeah, it's just another one of those. So here's the tool and then we put it in. And you're slowly oh. accumulating more ways to, to, uh, express an idea, which then helps when you have like a, Oh, this song, I'm trying to say this musically, 
but it, it doesn't quite hit the way it does. What if I tried that thing that I learned in this thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's, um, it's weird, man. Like it's weird to hear stuff that I made even not that long ago. And it's just like, like, I, you're like, <laughs> you're, probably, you're talking more from the production side, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not writing. Uh, but just like, it's amazing with product. Like it's not just the first production I'm proud of simple that you know and and i had a lot of one a lot of times where like i failed on the production front with but i tried a lot of stuff and so and that helped me get to to this but it's the first production i finished yeah. which is like, a, like you a like, like, demo. it's like proving to yourself that you can finish something because sometimes it's scary to be like oh am i never going to be able to finish it because it just seems that like the best so easy to start projects and not finish them. Which, would be, I mean, like you said, if you learn a lot of stuff from it that then you can apply later, that's not always bad, but it can be scary when you've spent a lot of time with half finished projects that you're like, oh my goodness, like I have nothing to show for all this time. And you would bug me about it a lot, you know, and understandable. Like, it was like, bro, like, you gotta drop something. Like, yeah. You know, like, yeah. It was really like a couple. Cool. It's like a two sided coin, right? Like anything, there's a certain value in not releasing things and just spending time learning and learning and learning. And then when you finally release something, maybe you're a lot better. But at the same time, that can be taken to a, you know, dangerous extreme where you never release anything because you're only learning, you know, and it's like, you're never yeah. going to be perfect. So you're going to have to choose an arbitrary point when you've learned it. And it's never going to feel like you've learned enough. So if that's your method you're never going to release anything and i finished like i remember when i because i was sitting on the song for a while too like it started to get to the point as you know where i was sitting on it for a while and i was like dude like this is not happening yeah i'm not and, i'm not messing this one up <laughs> no i just really didn't want to fail i was like i didn't want to fail yeah. i wanted it to be out and like that to me was success and i remember like getting really there were just a few things that happened out in the world and out in real life that just really pissed me off and i was like you know what i'm gonna finish the song like i was like using like that as fuel to like you know what screw it like this is the one thing we have right now we're like this is my thing and like i deserve to finish it like you deserve to be proud of yourself and i was like oh i just went into the studio and i finished it in two days i was like that was like two or three days and i went I went in, I cut all the final vocals and a few, and I, as you know, I did like a ton of vocal takes before with different, like every little alteration you could have on recording the vocal and mixing the vocal and how's it going to sit. And I was like, you know what? And I didn't allow myself to do it. I was like, dude, that's it. Like you're, you're finishing it. It's not like you don't get to test vocal stuff and you don't get to do that anymore. Now this is final. So I went in, I just remember I, I knew what I was, I knew I was recording final vocals. I didn't care what. I, I was like, that was it. So I did it all. And I, I think it took like two or three days to do because I was like a ton of harmonies and, you know, the lead stuff. And, uh, and I was like, yeah. And once you tell yourself that it ends up sounding great, because everything you're doing is like fine. So you're like, okay, Mike is here. Gain is here. Compression is like, you know, we're, we can change it, but it's going to be around here. You get the pressure, the, the added like uh, fire under your feet kind of. Idea. And also it was almost like I didn't, it's not that I didn't care. It's that like, I was so, t I, I would, I would have rather at that point put out something that was like, yeah, Hey, that's good enough. Like, like the vocal take is good enough. Then not put it out. Like it would have hurt more. I would have been more disappointed in myself if I hadn't, if I'd let it uh, become a thing where I just stretched it out for longer. Like I, I didn't want to do that. Anymore. I was like, you know what, this is it. And then you end up doing a really good vocal take. Cause I, Cause like, you know, you put time into this stuff and you're not going to put like, a, it's not going to be bad, but you just have to trick yourself into going like, it's not that you don't care, but you just go, you know what, whatever happens, happens. And that's what I did. Yeah. I think that even the outro took like one or two takes. It was like, done. that's kind of the burn all your bridges kind of idea. Like don't get yeah. a safety net because you're always going to use it. Yeah. I think it's good to have in the beginning, like when you're learning something, try, trying, trying, but then like, once you're like, okay, we know what we're doing. It's like, you kind of got to get rid of everything and walk the tightrope yeah. without the safety net and be like, all right, we're not going to fall. <laughs> like, yeah. No turning back.
And I was mad. Like, I was mad. Because I, I thought of all the times that I'd done it before. And I was like, dude, you're not getting away with it. This time. Like, your mind isn't getting away with it. Yeah, I guess it's important to be able to keep yourself accountable and or to have other people who help keep you accountable as well, right? Like, and it's tough with, with, with what you're doing too. It's like, you know, you don't have an editor yet and and you don't really have a team. And so and it's fun to have friends and family and stuff, but like at the end of the day, like when you're starting out, you're probably doing it on your own and you're probably your manager and you're probably your editor and like all this stuff, your agent. So... It's really and you're not qualified for any of those things yet. So okay. <laughs> in the beginning, you're trying to do all this stuff. And yeah. And well, yeah, but most importantly, being that guide, like that guiding voice, it's like, hey, man, you need to really uh, buckle up here and finish the song in three days. Like sometimes you need to be that person for yourself. And it's nobody like, hey, likes man. that person. So, yeah. No, but, but it was important. I you know it was funny, like those things that upset me that kind of made me come into the studio, but you know what, finishing it. Sometimes you need, you need something like that, at least for your first time around where you just like that push that fire, you know, and like, yeah, hopefully as it goes forward, it's not like that as much. No, I, I'm a lot. I, I knew this was going to happen. Like I knew what the first song it was going to be. Once I hit, once I broke that, the monster would never be as strong and as big. It's like, it yeah. would just never, cause you've defeated it. I guess it's probably the biggest hurdle. And even if it's not the biggest hurdle, like, you had to climb the hill so much that now you got the momentum going down. So it helps you get like halfway up the next one and you only and, have to a little bit. Kind of. And when you hit a hurdle, you go, I remember when I felt like this when I was doing this once. Yeah. And look at what happened with that. I put it out and it was great. Yeah. Like that's a really powerful thing. I'm sure there'll be new hurdles though. Like it'll just get bigger. No, it'll just be like sure. the next thing is like, oh, like now I have to, you know, make sure that this song is gonna, you know, <laughs> it, it needs to hit. Like it needs to get to this certain threshold or like, you know what I mean? Whereas at this one, it's like, I need to release it. That's like the first step. For sure. I think just knowing that there are hurdles and knowing that you've overcome them is enough. Yeah. It doesn't matter if they're different or bigger or whatever. Knowing that at one point to you, that hurdle with Estancia was this really big thing and you thought it was bigger than you and then you overcame it. Like then you, when you're doing this next thing, because obviously you're more skilled now when you have the experience and it's this other thing that looks just as big from where you are now. You're like, I remember when the other thing looked big. And, I, and I'll never forget like when I sent it to Andrew, because I was like, you know what, screw it, just send it to Andrew, send the mix to Andrew, I think it's good. I don't want to overthink this. And with mixing, you're, it's really weird. You're like, is the, kick drum, is the kick drum really loud? Is it not loud? I don't even know because I'm paying attention to it. So I can't listen to it just objectively anymore. Is it loud enough? Is the snare like you don't know? Yeah. So, and then I sent it to Andrew, and I was like, "Let's see what he says. I think it's done. I think it, I think it's done. Send it." And then he goes, "Man, the mix is great." I was like, "Ah, oh. you know, I was, I was done. I didn't do anything to it." Yeah. Well, it's good to have someone who you trust, who you can, who you can ask, like, "Hey, objectively, does this feel good? Does this yeah. sound good from your opinion?" Um, and if you really trust that person, then you almost trust them more than yourself, at least in the beginning on certain aspects. Like there's certain story, probably this, for you, I imagine the storytelling part, you trust yourself more, you know? But like yeah. with the production part, you're probably like, oh, it's great to have someone like Andrew that you can rely on and say, oh, you know, he, he really knows his stuff. If I get him to listen to it, he says it's good, it's probably good. Yeah, and uh, yeah, on the mix front, especially in like, and what I ended up doing with the final version of it was that I had all these mixes and I labeled them, you know, mix one, two, three, four, five, like I had all these versions of it and I had them in order. Every time I did a big mix decision, I would change yeah. the number. And I was up with like mix 23 or four or something like that. Yeah, you went, you went that in the down with that situation. <laughs> yeah, and that doesn't mean that there weren't more, like there were more. It was just, I, I had saved 24 of them. And I think there were even and I was like a 20 something and I remember it like me feeling really weird about it. I was like, I don't know if I over mixed this or what's going on. And I was like, I remember bouncing a mix of this for my cousins in the car for the car to listen to. And I remember everybody and playing it on speakers. And that was like this mix. I remember doing that with one of these mixes with, with temp vocals, but the mix was kind of there. And that was like, weeks ago 
I was like, what mix was that? And then I, I found the bounce on my computer. It was like bounce for, you know, the car or whatever. Yeah. And it was like mix number 12. So like halfway back. Yeah, like halfway back. We And I was like, I trust my ears that like, I trust that when I played that, I remember I bounced it for a reason for to show people in the car. And even yeah. though right now I can't objectively see how it's hitting because I'm really confused. I remember that feeling good and me like being really proud of that and everybody reacting to it. So I was like, I trust that that's the mix. So I went back and I didn't change anything from that mix. And yeah. I just did the vocals on top of that mix. And I think that was pretty much it. It was like, well, over mixing is a huge problem. Like even when I was doing Valencia too for Morgan, it was the same thing where it's like, you know, you're doing all these mixes and then you look back, you're like, I think the first one, was pretty good <laughs> especially with two tracks it, it can be really oh easy yeah to it's really away from i mean you. with more tracks there's obviously a lot of other difficulties you know but with two tracks it's sometimes like hard to be objective because it's just there's so little stuff going and, on and, and they're so big yeah each is takes up such a big section of the yeah, of like, the representative yeah, space yeah, right? yeah. It, it it can it can it's just different different challenges because like and then you're experimenting with like different reverbs and different things and you're like okay like if i do that like does that like, kind of use this i'm uh thing? i'm doing an episode of ben's podcast what? i'm doing an episode of ben's podcast we can pause for a second i gotta go to the washroom anyways okay give me a second then sick sick all right <laughs> got everything sorted out and uh, I had to get salmon. Sweet, made made some dinner and. Uh, <laughs> no, I haven't eaten yet, but I had to get it from the car. Fair enough, fair enough. Well, we've talked a lot about the um, the story of Estancia and how you got from um, not having released a song to then having jumped over the hurdle and and having one out, and obviously you, know, you got lots of other songs um, on the burner that are going to come out soon. So everyone should stay tuned for those as well, <laughs> obviously. But um, I just want to spend the rest of the time talking a little bit about for you and we can go back and forth a bit, maybe what it means um, for you making music, like why, why make music? What is the underlying purpose? Like there's many other things you could have been good at. Obviously you could have been, um, um, <laughs> that sounded almost like I couldn't think of anything, but I, I would just didn't think, it was re didn't think it was relevant. Like, you know, <laughs> the point is there's I would have been good at being a decent human being. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm trying to articulate this the way I want to and I'm finding the words are failing me a little bit, but I think I think you understand the, the I, want, I, want, I want to, for sure. I want to try to understand. Yeah. So for you, what is, what does it mean to make music? Like why, why make it and what kind of things beyond just, you know, I want to be super successful or I do it like, I like it, you know, what kinds of value do you think there is in making music and why do you feel that you want to participate as someone who does that? I think for the creator, I can only I I can speak from both sides as a listener and and as a musician, but I think um, I think they're very similar in what they get from it. I actually saw a Rick Rubin quote today that really I was like, yeah, this is this is true. Um, I have it right here. I think I have it. yeah, here it is. Art creates a profound connection between the artist and the audience, and through that connection, both of them can heal. Uh, so, but, but, but for me, I remember since I was like, since I can remember, I don't know what it was that I like, I craved this, I sort of longed for this feeling like the sharing this feeling with someone like i remember when i would get really excited about something and then i wanted all my friends to get excited about it and like them being just as excited about this thing was like i don't know i don't know why 
it meant so much to me, but I just remember, like, I think about it a lot because I try to understand that as well. Hmm. And I, and I remember things like that. I remember like, I'd be really excited about something that I'd like my friend would show up and I'd like try to get him just, I'd like sell him on it. I'd be like, bro, like, right. And then he'd feel the same way. And then for a moment there, we'd both kind of feel the same way. Hmm. There was something so cool about that. It's really and I think, and I think that a lot of us crave connection and really want to feel like we're similar hmm. and like feel like we understand each other and that we're understood mostly that we're understood and <laughs> yeah our and selfish I, selfish people that we are <laughs> yeah right mostly that <laughs> it's like i want to um, understand you but mostly i want you to understand me maybe right maybe or maybe a little bit and and i think the experiences we've had with music in the more communal settings as well. Uh, there's nothing quite like, like that moment being suspended that way and then everybody kind of feeling like one for a while. And when you write something and people relate to it, that's so cool. It's almost like, um, tell me, yeah, I don't know if you agree with this, but there's a certain feeling of like, sublimity in certain aspects of music that's almost like verging on the religious you know like this yeah. spiritual type experience yeah, where like this is bigger yeah it's almost like yeah. it transcends like being just in a physical place like you're you're in this more of a medium and i'm not obviously not trying to be like super abstract but it really like in the movie soul i i thought they they articulated that super well with the whole like idea of people really getting into the zone and like being in this literal other world, you know, in, in this, in, whenever you're in the zone. And I think, um, the late Sir Ken Robinson would agree with his ideas of like the element when somebody's really in the element, there's like this element of deeper connection in it. And, uh, I don't know, it, it seems very, very human, like a very human aspect, like to create and to use art to try to be understood and to understand it. And there's, there was, to me, there was almost nothing like the choral experience that way. Oh, yeah. Like, a like I don't choir, know. being a part of a really good choir. Is I don't know that there's oh, anything yeah. more pure into the, like, that really captures the essence in its purest form for me in music than that. It's just like human voices. Yeah. And the like, thing is, like, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful to be a part of it, but it's also like, there's something equally special about being somewhere where you're allowed to, you know, be a listener in something as intimate as that, right? You yeah. know, be allowed to go to quite quite Yeah, or to see like some someone who's maybe very superficially different from you, like coming from a completely different culture or like speaking different languages. And as soon as there's like that, you, you see people making music, you're like, oh, there's not that much difference. You know, like there's like we all kind of, I don't know, there's like a relatability to it, to it, I guess. Yeah. But, but to me, singing in choirs is, is probably the, the sort of purest form of what you're talking about. I don't think there's anything like, yeah, to me, that that's a very unique experience. And one that I, I think about a lot. I think about that a lot. To I replicate elsewhere too. Yeah, it's really hard to replicate and it's very unique and like, even in the studio here, like I, I'll play some of those songs we sang, like different versions of those songs. They just like, hit me really hard. Like it's just like the other day I played, I played like I went, I just played like five or six and just destroyed. It was like, oh, yeah, it's not always a great idea, but no, it really hit me. I I played like even stuff I sang in quartets. It's like I played, I played Lock Lomond. Oh. I was like, get out of here. It came on, you know, I didn't even play it. I was playing another song that was of like something we sang in choir. And then Lock Loman came up for no, like it's just on shot. Like I didn't even have it saved. It just came on like algorithm put it in. And I was like, what? Like what a rant. It's almost like it knew that I'd sang that song in school. 
<laughs> you know, it's weird. There's a, then, yeah, those, yeah. those like, um, I don't know, I guess like that Celtic influence in, in music, like it's just, there's something really, really special about that too. Yeah. yeah. Like certain, yeah, it's a very rich musical tradition for sure. Can I ask you the same question that you asked me? Sure. With, with, I assume with writing or with, cause that's kind of what you're putting most of your time into right now. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what you would want to talk about or? Yeah, sure. Um, can you remind me exactly what, how, or how uh, do you want to word it? Like why write and why want, why want to reach people with your writing? Cause I don't mm -hmm. think you would write just for yourself. Yeah. That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't think there's too much difference between for me, at least why I would write or why I would participate in music or why I would be interested in, in the medium of you know, dramatic expression or something like that. I find each medium has its own differences, right? There's just little ways in which you could express something musically that you couldn't express in a literary form, but at the same time, you could express something in a literary form that you wouldn't be able to express just through a song necessarily. Yeah. Um, so I think for me, it's, I try to think about what the story that I'm trying to tell, what medium it would best be expressed through. Like, is this a, is this a play? Is this a, you know, a short story? Is this a, a novel? Is this a song? Um, but as to why, in general, write for any of those mediums. I think it's just a certain, it's a way of expressing something that you can't express just through a more kind of superficial means. You know, like if I'm talking to you as a friend and we're just talking and I'm just on the spot, I'm not gonna be able to think about um, alternative ways to express my ideas, right? I might only think of one or two ways to say something and, and it's all so fast paced but when you're able to sit down and write you're really able to sit and think and you're kind of forced to sit and think about what you're trying to say and why is this an important thing to say and it, there's no bsing like when, when i'm talking to you right now i could i can dance around a question i can bs it when you're writing something you know it's like you read it again and you're like oh this is this isn't honest or oh no 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 i was onto something here but i need to say it differently and so I think that whole process of writing and then being able to revise and edit and hopefully tying it at least some extent into your own experience um, to try to express a truth that, you know, you feel or an idea even that you feel is maybe maybe what you're trying to express is inherently like anti-truth that you're like, I don't think there is a truth. This is too complicated or something. But I think even in those cases, expressing those really complex ideas is just it's a really useful tool. I, I think that's honestly what it comes down to for me. Like I'm, I'm interested in so many different things that I could be see myself, you know, writing nonfiction or, you know, studying yeah. science or whatever, doing a bunch of different things. But I just think it's one of those tools that I, uh, I find really helps me make sense of the world. Cause it's a complicated world that we live in. Right. Out of yourself, right. Cause it's like a self discovery thing too. It seems that too. Yeah. A lot of it is, is, I mean, everything's an element of yourself, right? Yeah. If you're writing a story, even if it's about something, someone who's maybe not very yeah. much like you at all, there's a little bit of yourself in all of it. And I think that I, one thing I really do enjoy too, is just finding parts of myself that I didn't know existed. You know, I'm like, oh, like this person's in somewhere inside of me, you know? A weird character. Yeah, it can be a weird <laughs> character. Sure. Like, yeah, everyone probably when they're writing about these like you know really manipulative villains or something they're, they're it's probably not a great thing to find out oh yeah i'm capable of this too it's an important realization to help you empathize with other human beings but i would say even more interesting is like you know we all have certain adjectives that we use to describe ourselves right and a lot of them are self-imposed some of them maybe aren't but most of them probably are like or different words to express who you are like you're funny or you're um smart or you're a musician whatever whatever it is i think sometimes it's interesting to find a part of you that you're like this doesn't seem to be 
what I would have thought I would have been like. But in this situation, I could see how someone would be like that and how under different circumstances, I could be that person, you know? So I just think it's a, it's a good, it's like, um, it's the true final frontier space is a kind of, you know, it'll always be there, but like understanding like the complexity of being human is something I would say even more complicated. That's a good one. Well, put. yeah. What do you think about, cause you're obviously right a lot too, when you're, when you're writing your music and there's an element of your writing, the musicality, the musical side of it, <laughs> um, you're writing, what is the tempo going to be? What key is it going to be in? What kind of, you know, different music technical elements am I going to use? Whatever. But then there's the other side where it's like, okay, what story is this telling? And so when you're writing, how conscious are you of trying to fuse those two ideas together? Like, are you always like, oh, the, the music is telling the stories apart, or is it just come whatever comes? Or how do you figure out how to tell a story from the multifaceted way of, of music. Cause it's not just as simple as writing a story in, in that respect. Yeah. I think, cause it depends, right? Sometimes you have a line that comes at the same, like sometimes it all comes together and it all sparks an idea and it's a lyrical, a musical and like a harmonic kind of progression. Like, so you're like, Oh, cool. Like I have the story and it obviously is going to make sense with this musical thing because it came at the same time. But I, I find those things you can't. I don't know. How, I don't know how much thought you can put into it. Like, it seems like you just you're there and you're like fishing for it or you're doing something else and it comes to you. But I mean, I, I can think of like some conscious choices I, I've made, especially on the production front, like you know, in the middle of a stunt, so there's the piano part, there's a sad piano thing, like that's, you hear the party and you hear the people and the piano's like, you are sort of alone. Sort of yeah. Walking from afar. There's a metaphorical like, element. Yeah, to it. like sometimes I'll be conscious about it like that. But in terms of like the melody and the chords and stuff, you know when it works, like you just feel it. And it, if it doesn't work, it's not going to hit you. And if it doesn't hate you, then it doesn't work and you're not excited about it. So it's like, mm. it, to me, if, if it's something I'm excited about, it, it makes sense because it hit me. You know, there's no like, the major seven represents the sun and then it goes to like, the same <laughs> play. you know? Well, like, well, I guess, I guess music is also much more multifaceted and, and subdivisible, yeah, right? Because you could say like somebody who's a classical musician and they're writing pieces without lyrics, maybe, maybe they are very, very conscious about what yeah. each, each note is telling. Like I imagine when Beethoven was writing, it's not just like, oh, ha ha. It's like, no, like there's, I don't know what was trying to be conveyed, but there's very clearly something's trying to be conveyed through the music. The music tells the story. Whereas sometimes the music is an accompaniment and sometimes it's a bit of both, you know, depending on what genre you're in. And, and I don't think that most times you could express music through words anyway, like that. So I don't think. I don't think Beethoven could have articulated what that melody meant because it was so far beyond anything you could say with words. You could only approximate it by titling it or just by like, I don't. That's why it's so cool to sing in other languages as well, too, because like, you know, you're singing something and you might not under, even understand or you, you maybe read the lyrics when you're translating it. But when you're singing, it, yeah, when you're singing it, you understand that something's being conveyed, even if you don't understand what the words are saying. You don't need to be able to express it with words either. Like you just don't need to because it's it's pretty cool. like you know when music when the piece of music hits you, like you know what it means. You don't have to be able to to uh to express it with words. You you, you know. There's no thought like you, to put thought into that stuff is like Yeah. I don't think it's like when more when I watched Morgan's thing on, on our on the episode, she's like, yeah, like the melody just that's it. She goes like the the one she has is the one that's there at the end like she doesn't mess with the melody like you know like when she said that i was like yeah that, yeah Makes like the sense. one you have is the one you keep because as soon as you liked it that's what it is and that's why you edit it it's like you just don't you can't even edit it. it's like it's like maybe yeah. you can but unless you like accidentally stole the melody from somewhere like you know yeah and then 
then you edit it. But <laughs> then you edit it. Or maybe you don't edit it. Maybe you just discard it because it's like literally the melody, right? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I don't know. What is but, it? Um, moving out or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's an that's a yeah. great story. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't I don't overthink melody, and I don't overthink. Uh, I try to be. I mean, with 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 harmony, definitely. I. I that's what I was just gonna say. Yeah, like I feel like harmonically, like when you're when you're looking at how do the harmonies influence the feeling it's it's a little bit more like a little bit more yeah flexible a, you know you can yeah, change you, to figure out what you want it to be you know yeah yeah it just adds like yeah it adds context to the melody. it's like you learn that there's more than just the third you're like oh you can do something more than just follow a third above the entire song wow. yeah or i mean like i mean with i mean with chords like with progressions <laughs> yeah you yeah know, like that too like right that to me is like when i'm working on a progression i'm real i'm a little bit more like i want it to feel like this story because like you, you sit down until it feels right and that's when you know like it feels like this is what it is and there's nothing else yeah and i guess it's different too depending on again what you're writing for because if you're, you're writing on the piano and you're going to play it on the piano everything's in one place but if you're writing on the piano and you're just using that as a tool that's then going to be, you know, expanded for an orchestra, right? Then it's completely different because now, you know, now it's not um, this chord. It's like these different moving lines. Like you start thinking about it differently. Like it is a chord, but it's like each individual instrumentalist is going to be playing one of these lines. So how does that affect how we write it, you know? Because yeah, obviously if you're a really great piano player, you could do like, several different moving lines but realistically if you're going to sing and play piano you're not going to have like a you know <laughs> you're not going to have like a baroque piece <laughs> underneath to the singing you know where you're like trying to do like four moving lines and stuff you know yeah i, I find that with production too it's like you know your your great production is a, just a great arrangement like when they were doing Sinatra's records with big bands it was all in the arrangement it's like yeah the mix and like make sure it sounds the production was in the arrangement yeah it's like we're not getting in the way of the vocals you don't not get in the way of the vocals with like this really fancy eq this plug-in that kind of goes out when the vocals come in and comes back in. no 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 we're just we're writing it super consciously and we're trying to make a great arrangement so that, that to me with production is super important. It's like, remember, remember what, like the guys that did it really well, the yeah. way they approached it and like staying out of the way of vocals is really <clears throat> So what are your thoughts with regards to um, pr production and musicality? Because I feel that sometimes production can be an asset, but it can also, um, it, it, there's necessary trade-offs you have to make you know when you're listening to like Ella Fitzgerald or something you're like you're never going to capture that trying to produce like a song in your in your bedroom with a computer you know you you, you get a different set kind of sound and um, there's certain things you can do to try to make things sound analog and what whatnot but nothing is ever no photograph is ever the original thing right that's never going to happen so like what, what do you feel yeah uh, with production like are there certain ideas that need to be expressed a really good question other ways or yeah i am um, if i understand the question correctly you know i'll start with like that like Al Fitzgerald example i think one thing and this is not at the at the risk of coming across as like because I, because this is not necessarily what I'm going to stick to. But one thing I did in Estancia is like a song like that, traditionally now, would it, would be fully auto tuned. Every part of it would be. And I didn't auto tune anything. So like the vocal's not perfect, because it's not auto tuned, and only a freaking auto tuned vocal can be perfect in like on the grid. Yeah, or, or like Beyonce or something. <laughs> yeah, but like no one's on the grid. Yeah, fair enough. I don't think anybody's on 
on the grid exactly all the time. So yeah, but don't you think that those I don't know those imperfections and idiosyncrasies are kind of what makes something musical. Like yeah, that like, maybe ties into my question a little with Ella Fitzgerald. If you're listening to it and you can hear the record in the back, that just makes it ten times more musical in a way, even though it's technically like a a noise that you might not want if you had the option. Yeah, and like even things like some people choose to not quantize anything, which is like depends what kind of record you're making. I think if you're making like, an, like a The Weeknd record, like you're gonna want to quantize those drums most of the time if you're like yeah. making like a Star Boy or something like that. But then again, maybe your kick is quantized and maybe your snare isn't. Like maybe your kick is on the one, but maybe you're playing the snare until you get it the feel that you want exactly right. And I've done that before too. And like maybe your hi hat isn't. So maybe your hi hat's just behind. Right. So you can do things like that, that go off the grid to make it sound more organic. Because mm -hmm. it's really easy with, with music that's made on a computer, which is like all of the music now pretty much, except for, you know, the Foo Fighters and guys like that that like, can record the tape, but like it's very rare. And they're still using Pro Tools. But <laughs> I think you can do things, like you can play, one thing is like, you can play the instead of just using a four bar loop, you can play the entire verse yeah. on the piano. Like the entire synth, you can play the whole thing. Like the whole pre-chorus, play the entire, don't use like maybe, a, and that's how certain ideas come. Like I did that with a stanza, like when it's building in the pre-chorus and the, and the piano starts getting like the, the synth starts hitting these higher chords, the, all that stuff is me kind of almost improvising it, almost like a piano player would in a jazz session or something. Mm spot and then i was like that's it that's the take and it wasn't like it's gonna then go to this voicing of f my major nine or i transposed it to e flat so like oh e flat major nine and it's gonna do no i was like playing it until oh that's it good you know like a lot of that stuff was improvising the moment because there's like usually two main synths in that song two or three it depends but yeah. stuff like that you know playing it playing it like let's 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 go to that like a lot of producers like aren't great players so they're drawing midi notes and like how freaking i don't like i don't know how musical and that maybe not musical how organic you could get by drawing notes and then you can move them to like swing them a little bit but like there's nothing like even though it's midi or maybe you plug in a guitar and you do it with like a real guitar there's quite, there's nothing like playing an instrument in a song, like really playing and sense programming it. Cause you know, so many, like I watch producers all the time, there's nothing wrong with it. But like, you know, program the drums, put the snare right here, drag it a little bit so it's this. And like, that's great. Especially me, like I don't have a drum set. Like, I'm gonna play it. But, but like with a, with a keyboard, like if you know how to play keys, like you're not drawing the notes. You're like figuring out all these different voicings for it. You're probably playing the whole part you know, at least for the chorus, you're going all the way through maybe. And like, so, so then it, it becomes much less, um, like artificial in that way. Cause you're, you know, there's guitars in it sometimes, yeah, they're hidden, but there's guitars in it. And like, and it, and if it affects you subconsciously, that's in the chorus, there's these guitars in the back. And like, that's obviously me playing it. And like, so it's a combination of both, like, and I decided not to use any auto tune on it, even though with a song like that, like, you know, you, you probably would. Yeah. I just didn't. I wanted to kind of feel like a little bit less like that genre in that way. Um, there's, uh, you know, the acoustic guitars that are kind of hidden, but they added quite a bit of movement in the chorus. And like the way the harmonies work, it's kind of like really organic. Like it doesn't, they're not these like, like, like it feels like everybody's kind of singing it together even though it's just me or not you so know do you, like do you prefer kind of trying to keep things as organic as possible or do you think that just it depends really highly on what, what you're making I think, I think it just depends on what you're making like i i wouldn't refrain from using autotune if it made if it meant that that song if it works with that song like sometimes it works i don't know like i haven't done it yet but maybe i will if it if I feel like it makes the song better because of the genre. I don't know. But even with um, 
like even when I heard the chorus in my head, I wanted it to feel like nothing gets better. Like it's just like people singing instead of just like this perfect pop thing with the harmonies are like perfectly layered and they're exactly in time with each other. Like I didn't want that. Mm. I even recorded the vocals at different distances from the mic because of that stuff. You know, I wanted it to feel kind of live. Yeah. Especially the chorus. Like I think the chorus feels quite live. So like in terms of making something musical, like being just aware of how your decisions affect certain elements is the most important. Because I guess when and, you're doing by default, that kind of can sometimes reduce the musicality of it rather than when you're doing something intentionally and saying, this is a musical. And it's really, it's really easy to, it's really easy when you're making music on a computer to, to lose that because you go, oh, loop that, quantize this, use a loop yeah. from here, da -da, done, auto-tune that, and then it's done. And you're like, oh, that was really easy, but then, oh, shoot. Right? But then it's like, no, like you pulled out your electric guitar and you did this thing and like, only you can play it. You can't freaking program an electric guitar last time I checked. So it's like, you know, or you played that synth part, you didn't just draw the chords. Yeah. Like, that's cool, man. That stuff's cool. Yeah. Like even a sound, dun, 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 dun. right? That's like me playing that. Yeah, it's like you're a musician as well as a producer, right? You know, like you're actually getting to play yeah. um, instruments. And yeah. I guess if you're a musician, then you probably like playing instruments or singing or whatever. And it, um, exactly. so it's a, it's going to be a part of it where you're going to try maybe as much as you can to implement that stuff. Whereas you could, yeah. even, if you have a great ear and you're good at production, you could, you can trace everything. But I think it's kind of like sourcing, you know, like moving further and further away from a source doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to, whatever you're making is going to be less valuable. It just increases the risk of error, I guess, if you're not really intentional with your decisions, because each additional layer that you add is like another um veil and if you're trying to make it sound veiled if you're trying to make it sound um produced you're trying to make it sound like a pop album maybe that's what you want but if you're trying to you know express something a little more visceral maybe you need to go back to like you know get an orchestra or something yeah, and that was really well said that's that's right you just have to be more conscious like i didn't have a drum set and i didn't have these like a perfect you know record drums in and i obviously use you know I played it on the keys and I used the samples for the drums, but like I played it, like I made that pattern, you know? And so, and I was conscious of, of, um, of trying to make it groove and keep it musical, even though like I could have pulled a drum loop from somewhere and just use that. But no, like I played, you know, I, the kick, the snare, the stuff on the, even like the outro, like, you know, making that groove was one at a time, mm -hmm. one drum. I just played one at a time. Yeah, super interesting. I think even within writing, for instance, there's like, it's not the same thing trying to write, um, I don't know, what they still refer to like in the literary world as like kind of a top tier kind of book, you know, like a very uh, intellectual, challenging, um, not necessarily easy to read Ulysses or something like that, you know, um, that's a different feat than if you're trying to create the next hunger games or something like that. Right. Yeah. I think it's probably the same in music, right. You know, like jazz is still jazz is always going to be jazz. You're never going to have someone. I don't think it'll ever be get to the point when, Oh, like these artificially produced songs will replace the kind of intimacy of people bouncing ideas off of each other in this collaborative effort of like a jazz club, you know, there's just something, they are different art forms in a way. Yeah. And I mean, you can tie elements of each in. you can write a book that's fantasy and also got, you know, some interesting philosophical ideas, or you could write a song that has some really great jazz features and is, um, not necessarily like what you would consider traditional jazz, but I think there's, there, it's just important to recognize these are, are not, even within music, there's different art forms. And also like not taking yourself so seriously and taking yourself out of the equation. It's like, 
I hear producers talk about it all the time. Like some people are so obsessed with being like, I made this and I get it. Like I am proud that I did this touch on my own. And like, that's really cool. But then there's some people that are like so obsessed with that. Like mm. I did everything and like, you know, like, well, don't you just want to make a good song then? Isn't that just the goal? Like, why are you so focused on yeah. being like this feat? It's like, well, I guess there's an element of like, some people want to, th there's different goals. So, so someone wants to write a, a good song. Somebody else wants to make a lot of money and somebody else wants to write an important song. That's gonna, you know, it's gonna mean something. It's gonna last. Some people wants to write, some person wants to write a legacy song. I think different people have different motivations and I'm not saying that any of them are right or wrong, but I just think if, if you have a different motivation, obviously your method and your goals and your process are going to be different. Yeah, or it's like, you know, the example of like a producer that starts the song off with the drum loop he got from Splice. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. That's collaboration. Someone else made the drum loop. You're allowed to use it. And that's how that sparked your idea for your song. And like, then, then we're going back to playing with people in the room. It's just a different way of doing it. But then someone might go, you used a drum loop. So that's, you're not a real producer. That's like, that's not true. What about the guy that went in with the drummer and he did the drum part for his yeah. song? it's like anytime you're thinking about it like that you're just you're focused on the wrong stuff yeah i agree i, I agree. also think i think that idea of like realness is when you come, when it breaks down you know when people are like you're not a real this or you're not a real that it's like it's a it's spectral you know like different things are going to be on a different spot you know something's going to be like this one's going to be maybe a really like intense song that very few people will appreciate. And those few people that really like it might love it. But this other song might be the kind of song that like tons of people like, but it's not necessarily super like impactful for those people who knows, or any variation of the, of the different things. So I don't think that like, um, it's fair to compare two different musicians and say like, Oh, this one's real. This one's not real. It's like, no, they're just different. And, but also we can't, we can't completely devalue people who are trying to make, you know, challenging content and say like, oh, like you're exactly the same as someone who's making like <laughs> this random pop thing. It's like, no, 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 like if you're spending 10 years working on something, that's a different art form than someone who's just making like something chill, you know? So I think there's a certain degree of like prestige that isn't necessarily like terrible to have, you know? No, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. It's just like, why else would yeah. we have Grammys or, you know, certain awards, uh, you know, like you need to, yeah, that's not to say, uh, whoever wins the Grammy is like, you know, they've faced lots of criticism lately. But, yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. and, and, that, and totally. Yeah. Like certain award systems lose their, um, <laughs> credibility yeah. sometimes, yeah. but, but it's like that idea. Like, I don't know if I, I don't necessarily love the idea of, I'm kind of with Richard Feynman on this one, like accolades. It's just like accomplish something important. That's more important. But at the same time, it's like, you know, Einstein and some person who you've never heard of are both physics, but Einstein's are physicists, but Einstein's Einstein and that person you've never heard of, you've never heard of. Right. So it's like, I don't know. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. No, I know. I mean, for sure. And I guess with music and with art, it's like some stuff's really popular and stuff, some stuff isn't. That doesn't mean the other stuff isn't, isn't good. So yeah, sometimes stuff that's really popular is like objectively not that good. Yeah, I think we happen to live in a time where like popular music's really interesting. Yeah. For the most part. Yeah, for the most part, there's definitely gonna be some songs that are kind of like, okay, how did that get? popular and yeah. things they're like that's amazing why is that one not popular for the most part i think we're living in like a time where it almost feels like in the 90s for film in music yeah you know like yeah like when when they were kind of letting auteurs do whatever it's not like the labels get to do any one sec i think this is the year uh-huh see oh yeah oh fair all right, well, where were we when the dogs came in? We were... Something. <sighs> Something about Mary.
<laughs> um, of course. You no, know, no, but let's 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 just leave it there. Let's leave that there, and then we'll go to something else. Fair. Because right, I don't remember. It was something about production, I think. I don't know. All right, so we talk. Anything that you want to talk about? I want to talk about CNN. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I've talk about the Obama. sports network since I was 11 years old, and I have to say that it has gone down the drain. I not have, what it used to be by any stretch of the imagination. I've been continuously disappointed with the con Don Lemon. Let me tell you something about Don. <laughs> <Lemon>. <laughs> I don't know. He changed. He was one thing, and then now he's like the other. It's it's like he used to come on, and he used to be on. And then I'm not. I'm like, <laughs> I remember being in conversations where like people would be talking about Letterman a lot, like back in the day, like like ten years ago. I remember like my aunts being like Letterman. Letterman's lost. He's lost it. I'm like, what? Like, what are you guys talking about? Like, how are you guys that engaged with Letterman that you know he's, like, lost his... Like, how much Letterman do we watch? All right, my dad's talking in the other room, so I don't know if you can hear him, but it's a... Uh, it's a double... <laughs> a double Zoom meeting now. New line. New line, Steve. Exactly. <laughs> 100%. No, he's, he's, uh, well, he's retiring. So he's just, I guess, doing his last rounds of having to call people and be like, yo, is this thing or something? Yeah. Did I not tell you? Wow. Yeah. No, I had no clue. I thought I already told you. No, yeah. He's, that's insane, bro. Yeah. He's like, it's time to move on to something else. <laughs> Crazy. What? Yeah. Jeez, that's insane. Bro. Yeah. Wow. So. That's awesome. That's crazy. I had no clue. I had like the slightest idea. Yeah. He was even thinking of 31 it. years, I think, in education. So that's crazy. Yeah. And we're just starting our, wow. uh, our careers. Yeah. Not, yeah, exactly. Like 31 minutes. Exactly. And we're like 31 minutes I'm, into I, the career. I'm clocking in now. I'm just yeah. In. Just <laughs> at the firm. I'm working at the firm. At the firm. The one from the from the book. Oh yeah, yeah. No, you're working at the at the steel mill, right? Yeah, it's at the no at the firm, like the like the the one where they gave you Mercedes and stuff. Oh well, that's that's fun. The Tom the Tom Cruise movie. Oh yeah, yeah. Based off the John Grisham book, right? Yeah, I'm working there. That's another guy who's like an example of someone who just pops out books and books and books and books. Yeah, yeah. He he really pops in. He's a smart dude. I like him a lot. Yeah, re really smart. And I mean, it's like I think the interesting thing with those kind of approaches is, and Stephen King's a good example of this too, is they can write a lot. And yet they still, I don't think it necessarily decreases the possibility that you'll have a really valuable book, you know, the only yeah, thing is like, I'm the only thing that's guaranteed is like, if you're writing two books a year, not every one of your book is going to be like, you know, in, yeah. whereas if you're like, I don't know, Harper Lee and you write one book in your entire career, you know, then you can become kind of a legend in that respect. But I think like you can keep writing and writing and writing and, and, both of them, those writers have had at least one book that's like very, very influential. Right. Speaking of Harper Lee, I started watching uh, Just Mercy. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's my goodness. First time you've watched it? Well, the one you, you recommended it because it seemed a few months ago. Yeah, yeah. Holy smoke. I haven't finished it yet. I, I was going to stay up to like four, but I was like, ah, it's not smart. Like, I watched like, I'm like 40 minutes in. I love that. Yeah. Like, oh. Great scripts, too. Like, I was yeah. looking about that. Why do you think they introduced the Harper Lee thing so much? Is it because it's like the white savior thing and like they keep mentioned, they keep rubbing it in this. Don't tell me if there's a spoiler, but I, they keep going like, 
have you visited the museum yet? And they're like, it's like that irony of like, we're still super racist, but we're home of hard of like to kill a mockingbird. And like, yeah, no, I think, I think what it is, is it's like, it's like the idea of like a conditional acceptance, you know, like, I think it's that metaphor of like, you know, there's, or alternatively, a little bit of caught in the past still, you know, because the whole idea is like, you know, people being incredibly racist, like, okay, you're caught in the past or something. But anti, like, when, when there's something as, as, I don't know, deep rooted as like, going from the transatlantic slave trade to like, you know, freeing slaves to like, Jim Crow laws, and then to like, you know, civil rights movement, and then you're, you're moving along a continuum where there's increasingly less and less oppression, but there's still it still exists, right. And I think each step on that ladder is really important. And it shouldn't be like, you know, you shouldn't look back and be like, Oh, Uncle Tom's cabin sucks, because it's racist. It's like, yeah, but at the time, it was an important book, you know, and for better or worse, it was white people who had power at that time that could actually enact that degree of change. And then I think the idea in that story is it's like, it's still caught in the past where it's like, you know, there's a, a degree of freedom, but it's still reliant on others. Like you, you don't get, you don't get the autonomy of being your own, your own person, your own, uh, like you said, ability to save yourself. Like you're relying on someone else, relying on some like, um, beneficial or what do you what do you call it benevolent person that's gonna do that so i think i think there's a lot of history in that um in that yeah, metaphor really, really, but i really push that metaphor. yeah they do but i think also it's the same count yeah yeah and i think that obviously that's not like an accident at all but i think like the writing like to, to yeah, use, using that element as a metaphor for, and I guess authorial intent isn't always super relevant. Like how you experience something is, is yeah, for sure. Is I know it's a very particular way, but it's so well acted too, right? Like the dude and the the shots of um him pulling into the uh, shot of him pulling into the prison for the first time, and the and they're out there working the guys on the horse with the gun you're like oh that's like literally slavery it's like a confederate imagery kind of thing yeah yeah that was very he's whoever directed that is very like likes to be very obvious about it like sort of to go like hey look at how obvious in your face this is in our yeah. society and he puts these shots yeah. like and there was some like criticism like of some people saying like that there was it was too political too much. for that sense but i think that like that's you know film. Yeah, I think it's a good film and it is what it is. Obviously, there's going to be biases like in anything, you know, and there might be some sort of com compensatory things in, in any film. But at the end of the day, that's on the onus of the writer, how they want to depict something. And when you're trying to tell a story, I think you've said this to me before. It's like, you're ne there's no such thing as telling like an objective, unemotional story. So like, I don't get it when people use that as an argument for why something's not valuable. They're like, oh, it's not valuable because it's like politically motivated or da 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 da. It's like, well, everything is motivated by something. Nobody writes anything to just like even history, which are which is supposed to be really banal and very um, base kind of writing. It's still influenced by whoever's writing it and their experience and their relationship with the events. You know, how could you call that like political when it's so obviously about just being a human? It's like when you see yeah, that movie, it doesn't feel I agree. very political. It feels very like, oh, this is just like a human rights thing. This is like really messed up. Yeah. I mean, I'm only I'm only 45 minutes in, but we'll talk more okay. about that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a great film. You, you got to finish it. Also, I have a ton of other good recommendations. I talked with Lynch, as I mentioned, and he obviously gave me some exactly. good <laughs> good film recommendations, as, as he always does. Yeah, that's the other thing I think for me, like what we were talking about earlier about why, like, why would you write or why would you do music or why would you do any of these things? It's like, I don't know that there, there's so many nuances to our world that it's kind of like, you know, having the, having those tools and being able to express something, being able to say something through like a truth, a real truth, right? Something that you're like, no, I think that this is, 
objectively wrong, or I think that, you know, this thing, this part of our society is flawed or da 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 da, whatever it is. Being able to write something that can then kind of demonstrate that without just typing, we should stop this particular aspect of society. It allows people kind of to see it in a different light and maybe to emotionalize it a little more. And then maybe they're going to be less likely to commit those errors in the future, whatever it is. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm, I really like that. I'm really enjoying it. And it's very stylistic too. It's got, it's got, uh, it's got taste. Where the, the beat, it's cutting to the beat when he's in driving, boom, and the shot's switching. I'm like, oh, this is a guy that's, it's kind of at the forefront of what's going on in film, modern, like in, right now. It felt very modern. Fantastic artistic direction, yeah. So cool. All right, bro. It's super sweet to have you on again. Um, Thank you for having me, brother. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll have, get this up soon and uh, we'll have to talk again before too long. Goodbye, everybody.